Hey, how's it going? It's George with Eden Church. We're with you in the final chapter of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, right? And so um, I, I'm kind of like I've done before in a few of these. There's some that, you know, you can just read through and look. Uh, what we're going to look at here uh, most poignantly is even in the point of wrapping up is really just being with Jesus. That's what I always say about Eden is that we want you to hear the supernatural voice of God. We want we want to speak spirit to spirit. We want to speak from a, a living, growing spirit that's on the inside of you to your living and growing spirit. And so how you feed your spirit, the word of God, you got to get it, you know, just like you feed. Hey, y'all can tell I fed my body a lot. And so what I'm saying is, though, we want to feed our inner man, the spirit. We want to feed uh um, him a lot and so and by feeding him uh, and if you're a woman feeding her because it's your living spirit on the inside of you um, feeding the word of God getting those uh, three plus meals a day you're going to grow into a mature being in Christ and the anointing and so uh, we're, <clears throat> we're going to talk about that we're going to get in here and we're going to get to reading I think we've had fun here in First Timothy it's taken forever. We've had some uh, stuff here that has uh, precluded me from being able to film for long periods of time. Uh, fortunately, that's all taken care of, and uh, you know everybody's healthy and moving back along and moving in the directions that we all need to move in. And so, um, we we started out uh, just understanding, even though this was a book, and we were kind of going through. We're wanting to hit the spiritual ramifications of things. That's that's what we're talking about. We're talking to your living spirit. Because y'all can go and figure out the date that it was written and who it was written to and this and that and the whole deal. But the thing is, is there's a lot of stuff that we get into reading that if we just read uh, without hearing, if we read without hearing, um, it's kind of, it's it's almost pointless to read. And so I'd rather you read with hearing, read with understanding. Uh, so here in 1 Timothy 6, and really this next, uh, ver next few verses, kind of trail on with the other verses that you just left um, before you actually uh, get into, you remember, we the ones who put chapters and verses to it, okay? Not the actual, Paul wrote a letter, literally. He wrote a letter. He didn't write and this will be my first chapter of this letter I'm writing. No, he just wrote a letter. I really think this goes better with the, uh, what we ended off with. But it says, uh, Let as many servants as are under the yoke of slavery count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine <clears throat> may not be slandered. Let those who have been believing masters not despise them, uh, because of uh, they are brothers. Instead, let them serve as slaves, because those who receive their service are faithful and beloved. You know, that's kind of a hard um, saying, especially in today's age. It's just one of those things where uh, it, it's kind of one of those things where we kind of look at um, they're faithful and beloved. Uh, and so... Uh, are you talking about slavery, George? Right. Especially in this social justice warrior time and everybody's political correctness. Well, slavery is wrong. Yes. Yes, I don't, I don't agree slavery is wrong. I'm also slave for slavery has been around forever, literally. Yes. And I know, well, aren't you black? You shouldn't want slavery. I was like, yeah, I'm not saying I want slavery. I'm not saying... Even this is one of the scriptures that people would use to kind of defend slavery and kind of move on. I would also tell you that the same person who wrote this also wrote that if you have the ability to be free from slavery, go ahead and, you know, be free from it. Like, don't don't seek it. So it, it's not a point. It's a point here that I'm just going to look at these two verses and just tell you this. It's just a point of contentment in every single area of life. Because the thing that you have, being born from above and having a brand new spirit on the inside of you, is so much 
greater than the circumstance you are in. And it doesn't matter what the circumstance. Even in the most lowly of circumstance of being a slave. Okay. And once again, as you think about slavery, don't think about the African slaves that were here in America. You have to think about more indentured servitude and in in the way the economies worked then. They weren't slaves like like the ones who were treated here. Okay? The but the thing is is that they were saying don't even seek that. All right? And so uh even in that state don't you know do everything unto the Lord. And he says do it, well I will also say he says do it uh, <clears throat> with all honor so that the name of God and his doctrine won't be slandered. See, I, I, I think that there is doctrine. I just think it comes from God. I just don't think man's doctrine does anything. I think God's doctrine does a lot. But he says serve people, even as a slave, serve the master so that God's name and his doctrine won't won't be undone. It won't be. It won't be brought to nothing. It won't be looked upon as like, you know, childish. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Live in any situation. So you're at work, and you're not uh, functioning at the level you should be. You should be honoring the work you do there as unto God. Wow, because that way, when you tell them you're a Christian. Well, you're a Christian, but you suck at this job. You're awful. Okay, well, you you want to be able to, they, they can at least know, well, they work hard. They may not be good at it, but they work hard. They do, the, you know, they put effort into this. You don't want to be that person that's like the slacker. Okay? And so, uh, as we move on, uh, we're going we're gonna to actually kind of tie in some stuff that we just kind of left as far as uh, with the elders earlier. But here we go. Is anyone who teaches otherwise... And does not consent to the wholesome words, to the words of the Lord Jesus the anointed, and the God and to godly doctrine is conceited and knows nothing. He has a morbid disposition for controversy and verbal disputes, uh, from which come envy, strife, blasphemy, evil speculations, constant disputes by men of corrupt mind. Being destitute of the truth and supposing that financial gain is godliness. Withdraw yourself from such men. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we are brought into this world and certainly we carry nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these things. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. While coveting after money, some have strayed from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, what we'll talk about here is is this uh, literally we were just in the last chapter and we we're talking about how you honor elders is by giving them and make sure they are financially taken care of. All right. So then we come to this chapter and it's like you know being rich is bad and do 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 and you're just evil if you like money and da 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 all that kind of stuff, right? And so. It's the idea that the, there's a few key words in um, this, and I want to uh, point it out in, in, in verse 10. The love of money. The love of money. The, the, the key point in understanding God has no problem, and we're going to find out later in this chapter, it's true. God has no money with you having the wealth or having riches he doesn't, do the riches have you? <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about this from a level of understanding to help everyone see it's not about like everybody in America, as an example, 
are the richest people on the planet. Our poor person on the street who begs for money is richer, is considered wealthy compared to someone in India on the street. And heck, for that matter, compared to some people in India that live in houses. Compared to some people in Africa that, that have huts. They have more finance, more money in their hand than they do uh, in Africa. And so by that uh, logic, if you will, when we're talking about rich or wealth or amassing wealth is, or what is enough or what's high, what's the point, where is that? You can never say what level that is at. And so I'm bringing this up to say that when we talk about the love of money, we're talking about the heart condition we have toward it. If you're talking about money and the love of it and being rich, there are certain people who have, who, you know, compared to a, um, a billionaire, they're not rich, right? But compared to the person who just started at McDonald's, they're rich, right? At what point is there, at what point are we saying, what's the number that you're putting on to say, if I had this, I would be set and that I would have everything I need, okay? That's the point that you would think rich is. And what I'm saying to anybody listening, most of us have a different number. See, an example is a billionaire who has uh, a, a uh, has a um, a fifty thousand dollar tab for something. They have a fifty thousand dollar bill that they need to pay. They would just be like, count it off out the pocket. Here, bam, done. Make, makes no difference. A person who's a school teacher in Oklahoma with a $50,000 bill to pay. Oh, that's a lot. That's going to take me 10 years to pay. Or it's going to take me five years to pay. It, so one person sees $50,000 and it ain't nothing. Another person sees it and they see 10 years worth of labor to pay that back. Right? And then you get some people who say $50,000 and they work at McDonald's and they owe fifty thousand dollars. That's like, uh, well, I'm just not gonna be able to do that. You know, they, they, it, and so it's out of it's they they can't even see a way to do that. Do you see how depending on where you're at depends on what is rich, what is what is poor, what is, and so. When we look at this, you can't just look at it, and we will then presuppose on this scripture that having money then is evil in the sight of God. And that's just not true. Loving money. Loving to the point that I need, I got to have it, and it's, and I can... Give me your money. You know, when you're, when you're looking at ill-gotten gains, when you're looking at, I want this just to have it and to hoard it and to be mine so I can't do, so so I, ha I have money. Okay, the idea there is, is this. If that's true, no Christian should ever have a bank account that has a savings account because you're not trusting God. I don't believe this. I'm just saying this is what we should think if, if that's true. No, 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 no Christian should have, uh, should, should it be in the stock market because to try to get better interest rates to make more money. Because the point is, is this, you're already rich. You're, you have more than that person who works at McDonald's and you shouldn't if that's the case. It's not the case. That's not what this is saying. What this is pointing at is purposely to greed, is pointing at purposely to our want of something in order for us to feel more godly. 
Okay. I, I want a lot of money. Okay. I, I, I'm honest about it because I know what I'm trying to do. I know that <clears throat> I have plans for if a thousand dollars comes in, I have plans for when fifty thousand dollars comes in, I have plans for when a hundred thousand, I have plans for a million. I, I have those plans because I know then, okay, I got this money, I can operate this. And what will end up happening is that money is going to go out to bless people. It's going to go out to be a blessing in my community. It's going to go out so that way people who are without will have. People who uh, are, are, are needing instruction, they'll be able to be instructed. I, I, I know, uh, oh, well, you know, people come into the ministry and they, they need Bible. They need, uh, they need other things. I'm going to be able to have all that for them. See, I have a plan for it that is not necessarily resting on, I have $50,000 and now I'm just going to cover and hold on to this until I want to spend it on what I want to spend it on. You see, I'm not loving it. I'm not loving it for the point of sin saying, I have $50,000, so I must be more godly than you. That's That makes... This is what the scripture is saying. That logic doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. The logic that godliness is great gain. What is godliness? It's knowing Jesus. When, when, when we know Jesus and we actually press into him as he, is, as he presses into us, we then will live lives that are full and that are expressed and that are, are a flow of the Father's love. That is great gain for a human. That is great gain for a person to know the love of God. And so uh, in verse 11, verse 12, um, but you, O man of God, escape these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. I command you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and in the sight of Christ Jesus who testified a good confession before Pontius Pilate to keep this commandment without blemish, blameless until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he who is blessed and ruler, an only ruler, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will be, or will reveal at the proper time. Man, it's like when we sit there and we kind of look at these things, holding on to righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, all these things are fruits of the spirit. I keep bringing that up because where I'm going to end with this is just, woo, okay, I get what you're saying now, George. I'm saying these things are not, when, when we talk about laying hold or when we talk about holding on or when we talk about follow after, we think there are things that we have to attain that, oh, hey, I found righteousness over here under that bush. Let me go get that. You know, or, or we think like, oh, look, oh, over here, I found peace. It's right here. Those aren't the things that, that's not what it means by that. I, 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 once again, go to EdenOK.TV, very, right on the front page, spirit, soul, and body, okay? Understand that you are a spirit, and that spirit has been born from above. It has the Holy Spirit in your, it's been mixed together, and you are formed a new man and, and complete in Christ, in the anointing, you're complete. And, and that is trying to get out. And so it's trying to get out. And as it grows, as you feed yourself and as you grow spiritually, the, the, the fruit of the spirit starts to bear. You start to bear fruit. Once again, you don't create it. It's not something that's hard. It's something that naturally will just exude from you. Just like sweat exudes from your body when you work out. It, when you're working it, that sweat, it, it, it just comes out. You didn't create sweat in the fact that you're like, 
I shall now sweat. You don't do that. It just comes out. It's a natural process. The natural process is righteousness and godliness and faith, love and patience and gentleness. All that stuff is natural as you tap into the root that is your source, which is Jesus. Okay? It allows us to fight a good fight of faith. And that faith is what we're confessing. It's being fully persuaded that what we're confessing, Jesus is Lord. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus has set me free. Jesus has put me back into right relationship with God. All those things that we're saying, we're, we're, we're necessarily believing that what God did is so. What he said, he has done. And when we do that, that's a good confession. Jesus had good confession before Pontius Pilate. You know, he, 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 he stood the ground. Pilate even said, I find no fault in this man. He, he held on to his confession. Okay? And, and so you understand, by holding on to his confession, we're seeing what, what happened. Jesus, holding on to his confession, then became king and ruler of all. And he will be revealed. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know? And so uh, when we look at this and we look at the idea of, of, of do we want to love money? I, I preached a, a series called God or Mammon. Go check that out. Well, I, I dealt with this a little bit deeper. I dealt with, are we going to love Mammon? No. What, Tim, what, what Timothy is being told is to get away from that and come over here and love God. Come over here and love him. Uh, uh, going, in, going on in, in verse 16, he alone has immortality, living in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen nor can see. To him be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this world that they not be conceited nor trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God who richly gives us all things to enjoy. Man, see, that's what I'm saying. We're not loving money. We're not loving the things. We, we do need those things. God knows we need those things, but God is supplying those things. And he's given, to, he's given it to us richly to enjoy. It's, it's not bad that you have it. What are you doing with it? Are you sitting on it for that rainy day? Are you giving it? Are you sowing it into ministries so that it can reap a harvest that comes back to you? See, when you look at the idea of loving money versus loving God, true gain comes from loving God because he can give you everything to enjoy. That's why we're not going to be conceited about what we have. Everything to enjoy. Um, you, you, that The loving of the money comes back into what we talked about last chapter. Hey, use your physical stuff to bless those who are, who are putting spiritual stuff on the inside of you. Because when that spiritual stuff is being put on the inside of you, what's happening is your inner man, your spirit man is growing. And as he grows, what happens? Fruits of the spirit just start to bloom and appear. Fruits of the spirit. Verse 18 Command that they do good, that they be rich in good works, generous, willing to share, and laying up in store for themselves a good foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of eternal life. Oh, Timothy, guard that which is committed to your trust. Avoid profane babblings and obedience. Uh, opposing views from so-called knowledge. By professing it, some have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Man, so that, that's how he ends out this thing. He just tells Timothy, stay away, basically. Check it out. Stay away and guard yourself from uh, profane babblings and opposing views. Stay away from that so-called knowledge. And, and what's interesting is that I believe 
unfortunately, a lot of the church has turned to the so-called knowledge. I mean, we, we, we have left the idea that really Jesus is our all in all. And I'm telling you, that's what I want. Jesus to be all in all. Okay? It tells us, and we're kind of going off here, because I really want to talk about this and the fact that we got to understand we're, we serve we're, we're, we're saying if you say you're a Christian, if you say you believe in Jesus, you're, you're talking about some supernatural stuff. And if we're talking about that supernatural stuff, we got to believe in the supernatural. We are supernatural beings doing things in the earth. Supernatural stuff has taken place when you come in to say you believe in Jesus. All right. But because we're not rooted in that, we've been rooted in the philosophies of men. We don't see a lot of the stuff that Jesus said we should see. Let's come on in here and look, all right? Colossians chapter 2, all right? Starting in verse 6, it says this. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, and abounding with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone captivate you through philosophy and vain deceit. In the tradition of men and the elementary principles, principles of the world and not after Christ. Look, look, look. we've got to be firmly rooted in Jesus. We've got to be firmly rooted in the anointed one. Man, we got to understand that our philosophies, okay, um, that's where we've, we, we've, we've devolved. Understand what I'm, when I, that's the reason why I spent so much time last year and so much time in these things talking about the book of Genesis. I talk about it a lot because I want us to understand. You got to understand. Uh, have you ever been told? I'm told a sidebar right now. Have you ever been told when you were a kid? I know I was told. I got lost at the State Fair of Oklahoma when I was like 10 years old. Like I was right there holding my mom's hand. And I went, okay, I'm going to throw this away, mama. And I go over here and I go to the garbage can, which literally... Like, I could see it. It's just right there. I didn't have to walk far. So I kind of let her go for a second, threw the thing in the hand, turned around, no mama. Okay? So what happened was this. Was I crying? Was I upset? Was I this? No. Because my whole life up to that point, my parents always told me if we ever get separated or if we ever, um, uh, or you ever get lost in a place, do two things. One, go to the door that we came in at. Or two, find a police officer or a security guard and tell them that you're lost. Two things. Okay? So, when I was 10 and this happened and I couldn't find mama, and I started going, I don't know, okay, of course, I was 10 years old. I'm crying. I'm kind of like, Mama, where are you? Because there's literally thousands of people around you. And I was like, I didn't even go nowhere. What happened? So what did I do? I could not remember because you're at the state fair. I mean, where, what gate did we come in at? I don't know. I'm 10. Remember, I, I was just more concerned about getting that candied apple than I was any of that. What I did was is I saw a police officer. Okay? So I went up to the police officer and I grabbed him on the thing. He goes, hey, what's up? I'm lost. I lost my mama. And he goes, oh, well, okay. Come on with me, little man. We're going to go over here. So he takes me to the, uh, the first aid tent. And he sits there and makes the little call. Hey, we got a lost kid. He lost his mom, such and such and such and such. And da, 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 da. Just a few minutes later. Like, I promise you, all of this time took about 30 minutes. Okay, but what ended up happening is uh, my mom went back to the gate we came in at. So she's there, 
And she's talking to the officer saying, I lost my child. I told him to come to the gate or find one of you all if that ever happened. And, of course, they're hearing, oh, he's at the first aid tent. Let's go over there now. So, of course, she gets in the car, comes over. You know, happy reunion. All of this took 30 minutes. All right? The idea of what I'm getting at here is go back to the beginning and find out what we were created for. Mm. That's why I've spent all this time talking to you. Because when we find out what we were created for, we can then kick out the philosophies of man. We can kick out the ideas that are vain uh, traditions of man. We can kick out all those things. And when we understand we were meant to be like God. Oh, praise God. Look at what it says. We're going to make man in our image. Blam. He's going to be a speaking spirit like we are, and we're going to put flesh on him so he can then be God of this physical realm. So what did Jesus come to restore? Okay, you start to understand that. So when we start to then fully look at Jesus, we start to then understand that, man, he, he meant more for us. And we've got to hold on to that. We've got to grab that. We've got to just say, that's my confession. That's what I'm going to hold on to. That's the faith I'm fighting for. It it goes on further to kind of give you the point of where I'm getting at. Let's look at what Jesus says. Because it's always, but we've got to look at Jesus, right? We've got to come back. I'm going to come back here and say, look, we're, we're not going through philosophy or vain deceit or traditions of men, but after Christ. That's who we're going after. And it tells us this in John chapter 15. I'm going to read verses uh, 3 through 5, and then I'm going to read 7 through 9. So John chapter 15, verse 3, you are already clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Oh, man, hear the word of God. I'm going to just stop every two seconds because this stuff, this is the, this is the Lord. This is, this is the Christ. This is the anointed one talking. You are clean because of what I've said to you. Get in his word, people. You want some clean? You want to feel good? You want to feel refreshed? You want to feel like you can do the, what you need to do? Get in the word of God, okay? Remain in me as I also remain in you. Inner man, remain in me as I remain in you. That spirit man, Jesus is with you. And he's, he, you, your, your living spirit that you have is in connection and contact, uh, contact with Jesus. He's remaining in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unfortunately, that's where the church has become and has gone. Many churches are trying to bear fruit on their own. Because they're not connected to Jesus. Oh, just tell the truth, George. Unless it remains in the vine, neither can you, unless you remain in me. Jesus, given this good allegory here, he's showing us right now, he's showing us that the vine is what supplies life to the branches. I supply life to you. And here it is. We've got to understand, man, Jesus is meant for more than just stories in the Bible. He's meant to supply us with life. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Man, that's powerful. He who remains in me bears much fruit. Once again, you're trying to make the fruits of the Spirit happen. You're trying to sell, you're trying to get individual things when God's willing and fully able to give you all of it. You just got to remain in Him. Our trust has to remain in Him. Now, I come to John 15, verse 7. Let's look at what it says. If you remain in me and my words... Remain in you. You will ask whatever you desire and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. 
so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Remain in my love. Man, okay, look at this. If you remain in me, but look what he says. If my words remain in you. See, that's what we gotta that's, that's what we gotta look at here. A lot of the church is anemic and weak because it doesn't remain in the word of God. I was talking to my wife the other day, and uh, she was telling uh, somebody, she was like, hey, you know what? He is a dude who's about the word of God. He, he believes the word of God is what people need in order to grow and be physically, I mean, to be spiritually strong. And if you're doing some stuff that don't have anything to do with the word of God, then he's not going to be interested. I was like, oh, look at my wife actually speaking for me and telling the truth. I truly, man, I have seen the word of God work. I've seen it work over and over again because you, you stay. I've seen people who were atheists and agnostic and, and people who they, they didn't believe, you know, they thought it was just one of the other religions out there. And I get them in the word of God. I get them reading the word for themselves and the word of God changes them because the word of God, once again, if you remain in my words, <coughs> oh, those words are powerful because they are attached to who Jesus is. You got to believe that. You got to believe that. Man, when you understand that God the Father is glorified in us remaining in Jesus. Praise your Lord. As the Father loved Jesus, Jesus loved us. We got to remain in his love. When, when you understand that that the that Jesus loved us, really, it's the Father that loved us. Hmm. We we've got a we we've got a really. Oh Timothy. Guard yourself, and what you have been told. Guard yourself. Look at this. The key of this is really verse seven, chapter. 15 John if you live in me now look what it says abide vitally united to me and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts ask whatever you will and it will be done for you Heart word, spirit word. Get that word into your spirit. Man, get that word into your spirit. If you if you live in me, if you are like united to me, my words will remain in you. My words remain in you and continually live in your hearts. See, that's, that's why I talk to people about scripture. That's why I'm like, that's why I put the scriptures up when I say I'm here. I, I, I put them up because I want you to see it. I want you to read it. I want you to get in the habit of like, hey, I need this to live. This is yum yum snacks. Okay. This is building me up. And so I, I'd rather stand here flat footed and teach the word of God to you than get up here and get an emotional sermon going. I go, well. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> is a vine. You know, oh, come on, man. It's ridiculous. I want you to know what this word says. I want you, instead of sitting there trying to figure out what other thing you can get into, get into the word of God. Not because, oh, it's just so boring. I'm just telling you, you don't want life. That's flat out truth. He, he made a way that you that the words that were spoken were written so that the words that were written could be spoken out your mouth, that it could dwell in your heart. If, you, if, if you're speaking the word of God, I'm telling you, the same power that the word had when Jesus spoke it, you will have that same power because 
that same word that comes out of you is going to have the same power and authority. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his word is spirit and his word is truth. It's got the same power today. We have to start believing that. That's what I got for chapter six. I want y'all go to EdenOK.TV. E-D-E-N-O-K.TV. Man, I'm happy because here in November, and it's not going to be right at the front of November because pretty much I got to do everything until y'all start helping me. Until, you know, y'all can help by uh, sending some financial support so I can do some of these things. But I got a new website coming out. It's going to be real nice. Really, you know, it's going to be a format friendly for all, all you know, whether it's your phone or, or uh, you know, iPads or gizmahoos and computers, all that kind of stuff. It's going to be friendly and whole deal like that. But uh, that's coming here in November. Yay. Um, what I'm really wanting to talk about and be happy about is that uh, we are going to be fully persuaded people in what God has commanded, what God has shown us through the the revelation of Jesus, the anointed one in our lives. All right. It says this in Romans chapter four. We end with this every time because we're talking about our father, Abraham, and, and what and what really was going on with him. And it says this in Romans chapter four, starting in verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. Our father was, he was righteous because he fully believed, he was persuaded, there was no, there was no change in his mind. God was going to do it. What God said he was going to do. That's how we got to be. We got to be fully persuaded that what God said in our life, he's going to do. He has done. And we thank him for it. And so, hey, go to EdenOK.TV. Uh, go check out some of the other sermons there. Uh, I mentioned a few this time. Uh, God and Mammon is one you want to look at. Go check out Paid. I mean, that's a, that's a good one. Um, we're going to be having a conference coming up here, Dece oh, not December, in uh, January 20th of 2018. Uh, more information is going to be coming. We're going to have registration uh, uh, ability to come out when the new site comes out and everything. And so uh, you'll be able to register for that. Uh, until then, please, if you could, uh, um, share with uh, Eden and uh, go on to the online giving tab and give to this ministry um, help us continue to put the gospel forward, the good news of Jesus that, I mean, he really wants us to be with him and, and, and his word to be in us. And so uh, uh, we thank you for this time and we'll see you later. We're going to have the gift uh, uh, revealed is going to be our next series. I'm really looking forward to that because we're going to get into the word Christ. We're going to get into what he's about. We're going to get into understanding. It's not a title. It's not a... Uh, um, last name of Jesus, it, it, it's it's going to be good, and I believe it's going to bring a lot of fresh revelation to us about who we are in Christ, who we are in the Anointed One. Okay, and so I want you all to have a great time. Thank y'all for being with me on First Timothy. Uh, we'll check you later.